So again, Proverbs 24, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 to begin with. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. Don't be envious. Now, it's easy for us in our culture to be envious of evildoers. There are people around you, maybe your neighbor, maybe a coworker, who seems or appears to get ahead because they cheat and lie and, and are always looking to scheme on things or take advantage of other people. But that's not to be our hearts. We're not to be enticed by that. Matter of fact, the antidote for not being envious of those who are evil is really to look at the Longview. Not Longview, Texas. That's fine. You can go out to Longview, Texas if you want to. But the Longview of eternity. You see, you and I and every person living here on the face of the earth will one day come face to face with God. And we will have to give an account for what we've done. As a born-again believer, I get to, and if you are a born-again believer, you get to say, Jesus. I messed up. I did all kinds of stuff, but Jesus. Okay? And then God sees you through the filter of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, sees you as guiltless, blameless. On the other hand, if you don't have Jesus to be your, your representative your propitiation is a fancy word that's used for that. If you don't have Jesus, then you have to stand before God just as you are. And some of you might even think, or people in our culture think, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not a Texas Chainsaw Massacre person, so I'm okay. I'm not this, I'm not that, but that's not God's standard. God's standard is holiness. So when you see evil being what appears to you and I being prosperous, Understand there will be a day of judgment and there will be an accounting for them unless they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so the antidote for being envious is to have the long view looking for the glory to come and knowing that there's darkness for those who reject Jesus Christ. Moving on to verses 3 through 4. Through wisdom a house is built. By understanding, it is established. By knowledge, rooms are filled with all precious, pleasant riches. Now, so we can look at wisdom. Now, remember, we've looked at wisdom, or we defined wisdom throughout the book of Proverbs as information or knowledge being able to be put into practice. Wisdom is not just knowing facts and figures, but wisdom is knowing what God says to you and then putting it into practice. And again, we're told earlier in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, remember, we have to define fear because oftentimes in our culture, we think of fear as somebody who's scared of something. Maybe you're scared of a roller coaster and you say, oh, that was fearful. And that's not the fear that God's talking about in the book of Proverbs. What he is talking about is an honor or respect for God. That you would live your life with the idea that I am accountable before God. And so this respect, this honor, or maybe we can bring it forward to the New Testament phraseology, because I am born again, because I've received Jesus Christ, because I've responded to the call of God, therefore I can have, that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of being able to put what the Bible says into practice in our lives. And all of us need to do that. And so a house, not just the physical structure, and it takes engineers and construction workers and framers and concrete people and plumbers and electricians to build a physical building. But to build a home takes wisdom. You see, a home, a Christian home, should be filled with love, grace, and mercy. A Christian home ought to point one another into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And what we're missing in America is, again, that sort of godly influence in our homes. One of the difficulties that we have as a nation is families are falling apart because they're not seeking wisdom. They're not seeking to do things God's way. And may your homes be filled with precious and pleasant riches. Now, that's not referring to gold or silver or rubies but instead a precious home or the precious jewels of a home filled with harmony in the home. Not that you don't have disagreements, 
but harmony because you're surrendering to Jesus Christ. A home that's filled with love for one another. Instead of tearing one another down, a love that's based in the love of Jesus Christ. That you would pray for one another. That there'd be stability and security in the home. That even if you mess up, you know that you're still loved. And that you can come back and be restored. And that the forgiveness of God is there. That's what a home is about. And it starts again with a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the intention, I'm going to put what God's word says into practice. I'm not going to do it perfectly. But I'm going to attempt every day to put it into practice. Pray for your homes. Pray for your families. Pray that God would bless you with the ability to minister in your home. Moving on to verses 5 and 6. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. You see, strength... And this is not just physical strength, but strength, the ability to endure hardship. That's really where strength is, is about. <laughs> I remember one time a, a friend of mine, we were helping a friend of ours move. Now, this guy is a bodybuilder kind of guy, and he's just, you know, Mr. Muscle everywhere. And I'm just a scrawny little guy. But so we're moving furniture in and out of the house into this uh, moving van. And I'm thinking, man, you're Mr. Muscle. You can just lift everything. I don't know why I'm here. And, and now he is strong, but he had very little endurance. And so after the first couch, he was, he was done. He's like, I can't do anymore. And here I am, the scrawny little guy, continuing on. It's not that I was stronger than him, but I had greater endurance. And you see, in the Christian endeavor, it's not about how high you can jump, how loud you can sing, but it's how faithful you can walk with God. And that's where genuine strength is. That you and I as Christians would endure. That you will face difficulties. You will face hardships. There will be days where you wonder why you're doing this. But endure. Be strengthful. I think the picture for us is more not the, you know, the famous story of the tortoise and the hare, the rabbit. How he's so much quicker and faster. But we need to be more like the tortoise. Not so much slow, but the idea of enduring. The idea of continuing on. Not giving up. And so strength and wisdom comes from not being alone, but by being with others. When you go through difficulty, you need to have others in your life that can speak to your life and say, don't give up. Or here's a solution. Or let me pray with you. And when you see somebody else going through difficulties, that you would be that Christian friend who would encourage them, admonish them, don't give up. Yes, this is hard. Yes, this is difficult. But Christ can get you through it. That's what we need to do. And so we need to have a multitude of counselors. Not just to let everybody know on Facebook and just take a poll on Facebook as to what's the, the best course of action. But again, godly counselors that can speak into your life and encourage you to keep trusting in the Lord. So in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. When you have big decisions to make, ask for others who are godly individuals in your life. Ask them to pray for you. Ask for their advice. That the Lord would speak through a multitude of people into your life. That you would then be a person of endurance, but also make wise decisions along the way. Moving on to verses 7 through 9. Wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. He who plots to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of foolishness is sin. The scoffer is an abomination to men. So wisdom is too lofty for the fool. Now, please don't misunderstand this. Proverbs is not saying there are some people who can't be wise. That's not what he's saying. Remember, the fool is the one who rejects the wisdom of God. The fool in our New Testament modern vernacular, the fool is the person that rejects a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's available. Remember the good news, the gospel news is available for all. Most of you, if not all of you, know the, the verse John 3.16, for God so loved, what? The world. We're all part of the world. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That what? Whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
you see again, it's an issue of faith. So it's not that, well, some people are just fools and they're just always going to be fools. No, it's about a spiritual condition. When you reject Jesus Christ, you become a fool. And when you become a fool, then you're not welcome in the place of influence, spiritual influence, which in the ancient culture was the gate. The gate to the city was where all the wise people from the town got together. That's where they uh, interpreted the law. That's where they settled disputes. And so you'd have no place there. You see, wisdom is not out of anybody's reach. It's only out of the reach of somebody who doesn't want it. Wisdom is not out of anybody's reach. Wisdom is only out of the reach of the person that doesn't want it. And so may you and I be a person of wisdom, a person that seeks wisdom. And again, recall here, the schemer, this is the person who's devising plans. This is the person who maybe lays, a be, uh, lays at night on their bed and is thinking, how can I pull one over on somebody else? It's that person that has four or five different stories or lies going on, and they're trying to keep it straight. Who, who did I tell which part of what lie to so they won't be exposed? That's the schemer. And before the Lord, that's an abomination. Abomination is another word for saying it's extremely distasteful. Something that would turn your stomach. Is That's how God views it. Verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. You see, again, strength is not measured by how many muscles you have or how loudly you can sing or how much Bible verses you know. Strength, spiritual strength, is when you face adversity and how well you do in the midst of that adversity. Now, let me give you a little clue here. All of us face adversity. Don't believe the lie that says you will never have troubles as a Christian. Because matter of fact, Jesus promised just the opposite. Sometimes that adversity is just what we would call day-to-day -day living. You know, it's it, the adversity of, of life. You know, it, I, I still have this problem. I, I, I've been praying about it, and it still doesn't work. At night, I go to bed, and there's a pile of dishes in the sink. And in the morning, they're still there. I don't know what's going on. Why? Because God wants me to do the dishes. And, and so sometimes it's simple stuff like that. Sometimes it's financial issues. It's relationship issues. It's health issues. Sometimes it's just different adversities. But your strength is measured by your ability to endure or press forward in it in the midst of that. In sports, teams are forged by going through difficulties. If everything is easy for the team, it becomes really, they become lazy. And so in times of trial, in times of difficulty, we need to endeavor to double up on our courage. Our courage is not based in yourself, but it's based in Jesus Christ. You and I, as we face adversity, we need to double up on our seeking the Lord. When there's times of difficulty, there's a tendency to say, well, you know what? I'll pray a little bit less because I'm overly stressed about this thing. Or I'll read my Bible a little bit less because I just don't have time because I've got this thing going on in my life. And that's a recipe for disaster. When you find yourself overwhelmed, stressed about anything, it means you need to press in even more, to pray more, to look for God's word to be a part of your life more to look for godly counselors, to be involved in fellowship with other Christians. In other words, you need to do more when things are hard. Unfortunately, our human tendency is when things get hard, we tend to isolate ourselves. We tend not to come to fellowships as often, or we tend not to pray as much because we're overwhelmed with life. But we need to be pressing in to know the Lord much more. So, the idea here is that you and I would calmly, on a daily basis, even in the midst of a crisis, submit to Jesus Christ. That we would ask God to supply grace for the moment. Now, grace is not just that word or that prayer that you might say before a meal, but grace is asking for God's resources at Christ's expense. Grace is saying, God, I need more of you. I need more of your influence. Lord, I need you to calm my heart. Lord, I'm anxious, and Lord, would you give me peace instead of anxiety? 
Lord, I'm stressed out about this thing. Would you take my mind off of, we're not talking about forgetting things, but off of the stress of trying to figure out something, and would you calmly give me a greater trust and peace in you? So asking for more of God's grace in your life, because his grace is sufficient. Whatever your crisis is, God is more than able to meet that need. The problem is sometimes we play the fool and we don't lean in and trust in the Lord at that moment. So look forward, lean in to whatever the adversity is, but lean into God in the midst of that adversity. Verses 11 and 12. Deliver those who are drawn towards death. Hold back those who stumble to slaughter. You say, surely we did not know this. Does he who weighs the hearts consider it? He keeps our souls. Does he not know it? Will he not render to each man according to his deeds? In the midst of trials and difficulties, especially in danger, or you see somebody else in danger, you and I, biblically speaking, are obligated to intervene in any way that we can. I'm going to re recall those of you who are familiar with your Bibles, you might remember the story of Esther. Esther was a Jewish woman who had become the queen. But she didn't tell the king of her Jewish heritage. And there was the arch enemy who wanted to slaughter all of the Jews. And he had set up this huge scheme to kill all the Jews. And Esther's uncle came to her and said, you need to intervene on behalf of the Jewish people. And she said, I'm scared. If I do that, I will be swept up in this conspiracy to kill all the Jewish people. And his, her uncle said, but who knows if not God elevated you to the point of being queen for just a time like this. And she in faith interceded. If you recall, she said, if I go into, please pray for me, because when I go into the throne room for the king, because he hasn't invited me, if he doesn't extend the scepter to me, he's going to kill me. And remember, she had just replaced another queen who had been killed. Her life was on the line. But she in faith interceded and God gave her tremendous wisdom. If you recall the story, she invited the king and the henchmen who had plotted against all the Jews over for a meal and then invited them a second time. And then she sort of revealed what was going on. God gave her great wisdom and also courage. And so we need to intervene in other people's lives. Maybe you find out that somebody is, has an unplanned pregnancy and they're considering an abortion. Instead of just saying, oh, that's, I'm sorry for that, you ought to intervene and point them to a place like the Pregnancy Resource Center so that they can have the information for them. We have that Harvest Crusade coming up this summer. You have friends, you have family members who don't know Jesus Christ. Don't just simply pray for them. I want you to pray for them. It starts with prayer, but invite them. But don't wait for just June 10th. Invite them now. Share with them now. I mean, God is a great God. He can save their souls before June 10th. He can save their souls afterwards. But we ought to be, have this burden that somebody else is in danger. If any of you saw a little, a little child wandering along the side of the road, I hope you would stop and pull the child out of the road. Even though you don't know the child, you don't know what's going on, but you know the child is in danger. I was at, a, a, at another church this weekend with a pastor leaders conference. There was a little boy, probably about three years old, and somebody had opened the door and he started to wander off like three-year-olds do. And there was about four adults there and all of them stopped and said, no, no, wait. I don't know who your mommy or your daddy is, but you need to wait for them. You can't go out in the parking lot by yourself. And that's what we all are called to do, not only physically, but then also spiritually. May we be people who are in the business of rescuing people's souls. When you see somebody that is going through a struggle, would you stop and pray for them? Let them know they're not alone in it. Let them know that God is able to rescue them. We serve a God who knows all things. And many times he gives you information about something so that you can be his hands and feet in the midst of that. So be available. Verses 13 and 14. My son, eat honey because it is good. The honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there, it is, uh, there is a prospect. 
and your hope will not be cut off. Honey is sweet, and honey, especially in the ancient times, and even today, was used because it not only was it a natural sweetener, but it has medicinal purposes to it. Even today, those of you who struggle with allergies, if you get a local honey developed from the local flowers and stuff, it helps you with your allergies, and so forth and so on. So, but it, the analogy here is, as honey is sweet, so is it wisdom sweet to your soul. Remember, what's wisdom? Putting God's word into practice. How do we put God's word into practice? It starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so let that be sweet to your soul. Just like if you have a cup of tea or something else and, and you want some honey or something sweet and you desire it. I know there's some desserts on that dessert table. I'm sure some of them look fabulous and I know all of them taste sweet. And as adults, we know that we're supposed to eat the other food first, but Sometimes we want to eat the desserts first. I understand that craving, but let your relationship with Jesus Christ be like that, that you would long to have times of worship. Maybe that's in the car listening to a CD. May you have times of devotional time with you and Jesus and let it be sweet to your soul. Moving on to verses 15 and 16. Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. I just want to camp on this idea here of the righteous man may fall seven times. I'm a man who has fallen many, many different times in my walk with Christ. Too many times, much more than seven, that I would want to ever admit but here's the thing. You will also fail. But here's the thing. We need to keep pressing in to know Jesus. If you have failed this past week, ask God to forgive you, get back up, and keep pursuing Christ. Because we all do fail until the time that we're home with heaven. We're not perfect saints. We're saints that are in this process of being made more and more like Jesus. So when you fail, own up to it but then press on. Don't allow Satan to just sort of consume you with guilt, consume you with a condemnation. The guilt that comes from the Holy Spirit should lead us directly to repentance that says, Jesus, I messed up. If you've messed up in front of somebody else, I messed up. I'm sorry. I said the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. Please forgive me. But if you will persevere, if you will endure, if you will keep getting up, and continue to pursue Christ, then guess what? You are counted as a righteous man or woman. Not because you're perfect, but because your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ, and because through and in Jesus Christ, you're not giving up. Don't give up. Verse 17 and 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him. He tur and he turn away his wrath from him. <laughs> it's hard as a human being when you see evil going on in the world and then you see them sort of get theirs, it's hard not to rejoice at that. It's hard not to take joy in the fact that somebody else has some calamity in their life. But remember this, we're to let that be God's business and we're to let God do it. Here's the interesting thing in Proverbs that seems to indicate here that if you or I rejoice too much over the calamity that an evil person endures, God's going to take that calamity away because we've made fun of them. So if you really want the evil person to get their calamity, <laughs> don't be happy about it. Nor should we be happy about it. Our hearts ought to be like the heart of Christ, that we feel for the individual. Now, we can hate the sin. We can despise the actions of an individual but we also ought to be praying for their salvation. Charles Manson died not too long ago. And there's a fleshly tendency, if you're familiar with all the things, the horrific things that he did and the ungodly influence that he was on other people, there's a fleshly tendency to say, yay, finally, he's, he's dead and he's in hell. But the reality is it's actually a sad day because you refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That ought to be a sad day for us. There's another person going to spend eternity in hell. 
Now, it's his responsibility. I'm not saying that somebody else has that responsibility. Somebody like a Charles Manson has their own responsibility. I'm just saying that God was willing to redeem his soul if he had repented. According to his own testimony, he did not. Now, what's interesting is there are other folks that were involved in the same sort of crimes that Charles Manson was, and some of them did repent. They have still spent a lifetime in prison, but they did repent. And the day that they would breathe their last here on earth is the day they'll be in presence of Christ for eternity. Not because they were a good person in a human sense, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 19 and 20. Do not fret because of evildoers, no be envious of the wicked. For, for there will be no prospect for the evil man, the lamp of the wicked will be put out. This is a repeat of, of verses 1 and 2, or similar. But the idea here of do not fret really is sort of too mild when you compare it to the original language. It's not fret in the sense of like we get worried about, oh no, am I going to get green lights all the way to work today or not? But it's much more of do not be infuriated over evildoers. Don't allow that evil. When you read the news, and sometimes it's despicable the things that you read about. And not too long ago, we read about things that ISIS was doing to Christians in the Middle East. People being put into cages and then lit on fire. People being put into cages and lowered into water to be drowned. That's despicable. So, but don't let yourself be infuriated where then it becomes only an emotional response. Pray. Pray for those who are doing the atrocities. Pray for those who are suffering under those atrocities. So the idea here is, is do not be infuriated in the sense of simply being mad and frustrated with them. Instead, continue to pray and seek the Lord. Verse 21. My son... Fear the Lord and the King. Do not associate with those given to change. For their calamity will rise suddenly. Who knows the ruin those two can bring? Fear the Lord and the King. Now, in America, we don't have a king. So does that mean that this verse doesn't apply to us? <laughs> no, it certainly does. We are to respect the government. Whether we like the government or not is really irregardless. I understand that there are times that we don't like the, gov the decisions our government makes, whether it be local city things or state-level stuff or national things. But remember, earthly r rulers, this is Paul writing in the book of Romans. He was writing under Roman occupation, and he said earthly leaders or e earthly rulers deserve our respect and our honor. If you don't like your mayor, you don't like your city council people, pray for them. Pray for them. And when you're given the opportunity to vote, vote for the most godly candidate that you can find. Don't just blow it off like so many people do. Take your civic responsibility seriously. Investigate. Don't just listen to the things on the news or the flyers that they send you in the mail. Investigate a little bit further. Find out who is... Now, I'm, I'm serious. There is no perfect candidate out there because each man, each woman is a human being and they're all prone to have their flaws. I'm simply saying pick the one that is most godly to be your representative. But you have to investigate. You have to invest some energy into it. If you don't vote, in my book, I don't think you have a reason to complain. You know, many people complain about this thing or that thing, but you ask them if they voted in the last election, and they say, well, no. Well, then, I'm sorry, you had your opportunity. So I'm just encouraging you. that We do respect those in governmental authority over us, whether it be police officers, mayors, congressmen. Respect the office, even if we may disagree vehemently with some of their decisions. Pray for them. And when we're given the opportunity to vote, vote for the most godly. Verse 23, these things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him uh, the people will curse, nations will abhor him, but those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. Here's the concept here. 
uh, whether it's in a formal court setting uh, or in our daily interactions, never make a judgment based on partiality. Don't just think that because somebody is blonde haired, they're always liars. Okay? Don't just think because somebody comes from this side of town that they're always thieves. Instead, look at each one individually. In the court systems, that's how it's supposed to be. But same thing in our lives, that we would not show partiality based on skin color or ethnicity or where they live or their level of education. May we look at them as individuals. Verse 26, he who gives a right answer kisses the lips. Now, that might sound like a strange kind of thing to say, but the idea here is those that give a right answer at the right time, it's an affectionate thing to do for somebody else. Now, this is not a a thing to go make out with everybody that you find on the street corner, but it's the idea of a proper response, a proper answer in the midst of difficulty or the situation is like being the most loving person that you can be. Sometimes, Giving that answer means you have to tell them the truth. It might mean that you have to tell them that they've got a bunch of stuff in their teeth and they may not like hearing it, but it's loving, it's compassionate to say, okay, you've got something on your face here. Let's take care of that. That sort of idea. In the Eastern cultures, kissing on the lips was culturally acceptable amongst friends. It had nothing to do with any sort of... uh, uh, romantic love or affection in the sense of of sexuality. It was just a sign of affection. So keep that in mind that that's what he was referring to. Verse 27, prepare your work outside, make it fit for yourself in the field, and afterward build your house. Now this is the idea of somebody who's a farmer. If you're farming, the tendency is to build up what you want first and then take care of other stuff afterwards. But here, Proverbs is saying, no, take care of the stuff outside first. Take care of the things that are actually going to provide for you first, and then deal with your house. In other words, if God gave you a plot of land, the first thing that most of us would tend to do is say, okay, well, I need to build a house on here, make myself comfortable. But what God is saying is, no, you need to prepare the fields first. So at harvest time, you have food to eat and so forth. The idea, again, is that we would be concerned about being wise and even practical things. If you don't have a home or you're living in an apartment or something else, nothing wrong with owning a home, but make sure you got your finances taken care of first as opposed to just getting a loan because they said you can have X amount of money. But look for preparing yourself correctly. And then afterwards, take care of the home. Afterwards, take care of the physical structure. None of us, none of your bosses would say, well, you know, if you didn't show up for work one day and they, you said to them, well, I had to mow the grass. They would say, well, mow the grass on your own time. You're fired. And so if you got the perfect yard, but you've got no income, what, what benefit is that? I'm not saying not to take care of your yard. I'm just saying keep the right priorities. Verse 28 and 29. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. For would you deceive with your lips? Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Don't be vindictive, in other words. Just because your neighbor flips you off every time you try to wave at them doesn't give you an excuse to flip them off. And then don't falsely bring accusations against your neighbor. Speak the truth, but we're called to speak the truth in love. Over in Thessalonians chapter 5, it tells us this. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both in yourself and for all. This is God's instructions to us. We're not to be that vindictive neighbor. I know in the flesh, sometimes we want to be that way. Or that co-worker. The co-worker that's always telling, um, uh, cutting you down, or that co-worker that's always trying to take credit for work or discrediting your work, and there's a fleshly tendency to, to get one back on them. Instead, may our lips and our actions not return evil for evil, but instead may we pursue good and literally build others up. 
verses 30 through 34, I went to the field of a lazy man by the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding, and there it was all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I understood well. I looked on it and received instruction. So this is criticism against those who are not willing to be diligent or they're more lazy. And what's their excuse? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. If you and I are not diligent in our own personal spiritual journeys, our own personal walks with the Lord, if we're not diligent in just practical things, in other words, I was teasing about mowing the lawns. I can tell you this, it's much easier to mow it when it's a little high instead of a foot high. And there's a tendency in our flesh to say, well, I'll just do that tomorrow. I'll take care of that later. Especially when it comes to our spiritual walk, our spiritual journey. It's easy for us to say, well, I went to church last week, so I won't come this week. Or I prayed, you know, last week, so I won't pray t- this week. Uh, you know, I, I went, you know, I'm interested in going to the women's study, but I went two weeks in a row, so I'll just kind of back off. I'm a little bit tired this week. I understand fatigue. I'm not talking about fatigue. I'm talking about this laziness that any of us can have. This idea of a little sleep, a little slumber, is the lazy individual rationalizes their neglect of what their responsibilities are. If you live in a home, you live in a, in a neighborhood of some sort, you have a responsibility to mow your grass. Spiritually, as a Christian, we have a responsibility to cultivate our relationship with the Lord. Don't allow excuses to get in that way. There really is no excuse because you can pray anywhere. You can pray in the shower. You can pray in the car. You can pray in the parking lot before work, after work. Uh, You can pray in your lunch break. We can pray anywhere. We oftentimes just allow ourselves to be distracted with other things. That's why something like this, those prayer cards for the um, Harvest America are helpful, but it doesn't help if you just stick it in the back seat of your car and don't see it until next Sunday. It doesn't help if you stick it in your Bible, but you don't open your Bible till next Sunday. Put it someplace where you'll remember. Get one of those magnets and put it on your refrigerator or someplace where you'll see it to cause you to remember. Remember to pray, not only for harvest, but then also for the family members and other people in your life. Pray for their salvation. Pray for those who are sick. Pray for those that are having difficulties. Pray for your own spiritual growth. If you find yourself having a difficult time, I urge you to pray that God would give you an unction, even a greater desire to pray, to read His Word, to gather together in fellowship, and even a greater burden and a desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Pray and ask God. This morning, we're going to have communion together. We didn't do it last week because it was Easter. uh, So we're doing it this week. So we can take some time and then we're going to break bread. We're going to do the the whole fellowship thing like the early church did. We're just going to do communion first and then afterwards we'll do the fellowship meal. But I want to remind you what communion is about. Communion is about remembering, recalling, and reestablishing or or confirming your own relationship with Jesus Christ. The bread that we'll talk about in a few minutes represents the body of Jesus Christ being crucified for us that we remembered on Good Friday. The blood, the, the little cup, represents the blood of Jesus Christ, this new covenant relationship about God empowering us to live for Him. Now, it's a reminder of those things. But before the elements are passed out, I just want to ask you, Where are you at in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it just a fairy tale to you? Or is Jesus Christ real in the depth of your heart? Is it just a religious activity? Or is it something significant to you personally? I want to urge you that if there's anything amiss between you and God, that you would take the next few moments and literally in the depth of, depth of your heart, the quietness of your own heart and mind, say, Jesus, forgive me for, you fill in the blank. 
I ran over grandmother yesterday. Please forgive me for that. Or whatever else it might be. Lord, forgive me. Create in me a clean heart. Lord, renew a right spirit within me. And if this morning, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, or if you've been wandering and drifting away, I urge you in the next few moments to pray and ask God to renew again that right spirit. Don't take communion as just a religious thing. Just because we as a church have said, okay, we're having communion today, doesn't mean that you should just take it without consideration. Consider it. Understand it. It is much more than just a little bit of grape juice and a cracker. It represents our relationship with Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on that cross a little over 2,000 years ago, being a holy, perfect man, fully God, and he willingly took on the guilt of my sin and your sin. And not only that, to forgive us of our sin, but then also through the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, to empower us to live for him. Don't buy into the lies of Satan that says you just can't be this or that. God can purify your heart. God can renew your mind. God can change the way that you behave. But you've got to ask him and let him. Don't be the fool that in stubbornness says, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it my own way. Instead, be that wise woman, that wise man that pleads for God's help.